Good day, and thank you for staying by, and welcome to the Variant Systems, Inc. Q3 2022 Earnings Conference Call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. After the speaker's presentation, there will be a question and answer session. Please be advised this call is being recorded. If you require any further assistance, please press star zero. We would now like to hand the conference over to your host today, Matthew Frankel. You may begin. Thank you, operator. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining our conference call today. I'm here with Dan Bodner, Barron's CEO, Doug Robinson, Barron's CFO, and Alan Roden, Barron's Chief Corporate Development Officer. Before getting started, I'd like, I'd like to mention that accompanying our call today is a WebEx with slides. If you'd like to view these slides in real time during the call, please visit the IR section of our website at barron.com. Click on the Investor Relations tab, and click on the webcast link and select today's conference call. I'd also like to draw your attention to the fact that certain matters discussed on this call may contain forward-looking statements within the meaning of the Private Securities Litigation Reform Act of 1995 and other provisions of federal securities laws. These forward-looking statements are based on management's current expectations and are not guarantees of future performance. Actual results could differ materially from those expressed in or implied by these forward-looking statements. The forward-looking statements are made as of the date of this call and, as except as required by law, Barron assumes no obligation to update or revise them. Investors are cautioned not to place undue reliance on these forward-looking statements. For a more detailed discussion of how these and other risks and uncertainties could cause variance actual results to differ materially from those indicated in these forward-looking statements, please see our Form 10-K for the fiscal year ended January 31, 2021, and other filings we make with the SEC. The financial measures discussed today include non-GAAP measures, as we believe investors focus on those measures and comparing results between periods and among our peer companies. Please see today's WebEx slide and our earnings release in the Investor Relations section of our website at Barrett.com for a reconciliation of non-GAAP financial measures to GAAP measures. Non-GAAP financial information should not be considered in isolation from, as a substitute for, or superior to GAAP financial information. But is included because management believes it provides meaningful supplemental information regarding our operating results when assessing our business and is useful to investors for informational and comparative purposes. The non-GAAP financial measures the company uses have limitations and may differ from those used by other companies. Now, I'd like to turn the call over to Dan. Dan. Thank you, Matt. I'm pleased to report the momentum we experienced in the first half of the year continued in our third quarter. We had strong cloud revenue growth, strong new PLE booking growth, and overall revenue and diluted earnings per share coming in significantly ahead of our expectations. Looking ahead, we expect the momentum to continue in Q4 and are raising our annual guidance for non-GAAP revenue to $875 million at the midpoint of our range. We are also raising our annual guidance for both cloud revenue growth and new PLE booking growth. We believe our results and improved outlook reflect the differentiation of our cloud platform and our strong execution following the spin of our security business earlier this year. At the time of the spin, we provided three-year targets for our cloud-first strategy and accelerating growth. I'm pleased to report that we are tracking ahead of our three-year plan. We're introducing guidance for next year above our prior targets and also increasing our targets for fiscal 24. Let me start with our Q3 results and discuss what we believe is behind our strong cloud growth and booking momentum. In Q3, our cloud revenue grew 33% on a GAAP basis and 32% on a non-GAAP basis year over year. We expect our strong cloud revenue growth to continue in Q4, and we are raising our guidance for more than 35% for the year. We also had strong new booking growth on a PLE basis across new logos and existing customers with 21 large cloud orders, each in excess of $1 million TCV. New PLE bookings increased 14% year over year in Q3 and we are raising our outlook for the year to more than 15%. Our numerous multi-million cloud orders 
and in Q3 included some of the more notable brands in the world, such as Costco, Disney, Goldman Sachs, and HP. Regarding new customers, I'm glad to report that during Q3, we added more than 100 new logos, including Western Digital, Blackstone, Eventbrite, Network Markets, and the Bank of Hawaii. Regarding existing customers, we had many expansions as a cloud platform strategy makes it easier and faster for customers to expand and benefit from our, from our AI innovation. Overall, we had strong booking momentum and are pleased with the addition of many new customers. In Q3, we continue to innovate and introduce new capabilities in our cloud platform to help brands close the engagement capacity gap. For example, we recently announced new AI-driven real-time agent assist capabilities, including real-time sentiment analysis and a new highly accurate cloud transcription engine based on deep neural network models. We also introduced in our cloud platform new social messaging functionality that can be deployed together with intelligent virtual assistants to automate social messaging. A cloud platform has an open multi-cloud architecture that enables us to deliver innovation at an accelerated pace. Our openness enables the platform to seamlessly fit with existing enterprise ecosystems. It provides customers out-of-the-box integrations with many communication infrastructure, enterprise data, and CRM vendors. This strategy of a truly open and agnostic platform is very attractive to both our customers and a growing set of partners. At the heart of our cloud platform is Verin DaVinci AI, which drives strong automation and customer ROI. Because the platform is also modular, brands are able to deploy our workforce engagement, digital first engagement, and experience management based on their business priorities to close the engagement capacity gap. Looking forward, we are pleased with the momentum we experienced throughout this year and are introducing guidance for next year, fiscal 23, above our prior targets. For fiscal 23, we now expect $935 million of total revenue, reflecting 7% growth, up from our prior target of 6%. We also expecting 30% cloud revenue growth, driving cloud revenue to over $500 million, around 55% of our total revenue. As previously discussed, our shift to the cloud will positively impact cash flow, and we're expecting more than 20% growth in cash flow operations next year. Behind our improved growth outlook for fiscal 23 is our significant bookings momentum this year. As a reminder, since the beginning of fiscal 22, we have raised our outlook multiple times for new PLE booking growth, which is a leading indicator of future revenue growth. In addition, I would like to point out that we expect to finish the year with non-GAAP cloud revenue in Q4 of around $117 million, providing us with a solid starting point to achieve more than $500 million in cloud revenue next year. Turning to fiscal 24, we are now targeting 10% revenue growth, which will take us to $1 billion and $30 million of revenue, up from previous target of high single-digit growth. We are also raising our cloud revenue target for fiscal 24 to over $650 million, with another year of 30% growth. I would like to take a minute to review our multi-year cloud journey. In fiscal 19, only around 20% of our total revenue came from the cloud, 
And we're now expecting around 55% next year and targeting around 65% in fiscal 24. Shifting our revenue mix to the cloud has had many benefits to variants, including more recurring revenue, better visibility, and improved economics over the customer lifetime. In summary, I'm very pleased with our significant progress on all fronts. Since the spin, we've posted three quarters of strong results, executing ahead of our three-year plan, and we're now raising our targets again. Our AI-powered cloud platform is differentiated and delivers significant ROI to customers. And our open and partner-friendly strategy is resonating well in the market, and we are adding many new customers. Finally, I would like to thank our employees for the hard work and dedication. We continue to hear from our employees that they like our strong customer-centric culture and our focus on customer engagement as the pure play company. Now let me turn the call over to Doug to provide more details on our Q3 results and outlook. Doug? Yeah, thanks, Dan. Good afternoon, everyone. Our discussion today will include non-GAAP financial measures. A reconciliation between our GAAP and non-GAAP financial measures is available, as Matt mentioned, in our earnings release and in the IR section of our website. Differences between our GAAP and non-GAAP financial measures include adjustments related to acquisitions, including fair value revenue adjustments, amortization of acquisition-related intangibles, certain other acquisition-related expenses, stock-based compensation expenses, separation-related expenses, as well as certain other items that can vary significantly in amount and frequency from period to period. For certain metrics, it also includes adjustments related to foreign exchange rates. As Dan mentioned, our Q3 results came in ahead of expectations, and we're pleased to be raising our annual guidance and long-term targets. For Q3, non-GAAP revenue came in at $227 million. Non-GAAP cloud revenue increased 32% year-over-year. New PLE bookings increased 14% year-over-year. Non-GAAP gross margin came in at 71%. Non-GAAP operating margins came in at 27%. Non-GAAP diluted EPS came in at $0.69. Cents. And remaining performance obligations, or RPO, increased 31% year-over-year. We're pleased with our overachievement on both the top and bottom line. Our top line overachievement was due to strong demand for our cloud solutions, as well as a $4 million perpetual order coming in in Q3, which we previously expected to come in during Q4. Our Q3 bottom line was positively impacted by higher revenue and some expenses being delayed to Q4. For the year, we now expect $875 million of revenue, plus or minus 1%, up from our prior guidance, of $872 million and our initial guidance of $860 million. We expect cloud revenue growth in the range of 35 to 37%, up from our prior guidance of 35% and our initial guidance of 30%. I'd like to mention that customers converting existing solutions to the cloud represent close to 40% of our expected cloud revenue growth, and the remaining 60-plus percent is driven by new deployments. We expect new PLE bookings growth in the range of 15 to 17 percent, up from our prior guidance of 15 percent and our initial guidance of 10 percent. From a mixed perspective, we expect 60 percent of new PLE bookings to come in from SaaS in Q4. We expect $2.25 percent of non-GAAP diluted EPS at the midpoint of our revenue guidance, based on 75.9 million diluted shares outstanding for the year. I'd now like to discuss guidance for our next fiscal year ending January 31, 2023. For revenue, we are introducing guidance above our prior target and expect $935 million in revenue, plus or minus 2%, or 7% growth, which is being driven by our strong PLE bookings. For new PLE bookings growth next year, we are also guiding above our prior target to a range of 10 to 12%. Our pipeline is rapidly shifting to SaaS, and next year we expect around 65% of new PLE bookings to come from SaaS for the full year. We expect cloud revenue to exceed $500 million and to represent approximately 55% of our total revenue. 
With continued margin expansion, we expect $2.49 diluted EPS at the midpoint of our revenue guidance, reflecting nearly 11% growth year over year. We expect to generate $200 million of GAAP cash from operations, reflecting more than 20% growth year over year on a normalized basis. I'd also like to provide you some additional detail for your models. We expect around $1.5 million per quarter of interest and other expense. We expect about 300000 per quarter of net income from a non-controlling interest we have in a small joint venture. We expect an 11% cash tax rate for the year. And we expect $75.9 million of fully diluted shares flat with this year. Similar to fiscal 22, we intend to repurchase shares in fiscal 23 to offset dilution from our equity compensation program, and we announced today that our board has approved a new buyback program for next year. In summary, we're very pleased with our strong momentum and are tracking ahead of our three-year plan we laid out at the beginning of the year. We expect our revenue growth rate to accelerate from 4% this year to 7% next year and are targeting 10% the year after. From a mixed perspective, we're targeting nearly two-thirds of our revenue in fiscal 24 to come from cloud. As we approach the holiday season, I'd like to thank our employees during an unprecedented time in the market. Our strong results are due to your hard work, thought leadership, and commitment to serving our customers. So with that, operator, let's open up the line for questions. Thank you. As a reminder, to ask a question, you'll need to press star 1 on your telephone. To withdraw your question, press the pound key. Please stand by while we compile the Q&A roster. And our first question comes from Ryan McDonald from Needham. Your line is now open. Hi, thanks for taking my question and congrats on an excellent quarter here. Um, you know, again, I was most impressed by the uh, strong uh, new customer, new logo additions, and I think over 100 in the quarter you mentioned and over 60% of PLE bookings coming from new customers. Just love to understand a little bit more where, where that strength is coming from, whether it's, you know, you're seeing sort of a, a surge in demand in the marketplace from new customers as they, you know, spend on digital transformations, or is this this come down to just great sales execution? Would love a little more color there. Thanks. Yeah, th yes, thank you. Uh, so I think it's, uh, it comes from demand for a cloud platform. Uh, we, we, we discussed before that a cloud platform is, is differentiated. It's... Uh, um, helpful to our customers to um, innovate faster so the, because they can consume applications from the platform easier than on, on an on-prem basis. Uh, we do see a, a also increase in partners execution with the cloud platforms and, and, and growth with partners. So um, I, I think it's, uh, it's really the overall positioning from a product perspective as well as our partner agnostic strategy. Uh, we we actually did mention on the call first time a uh, hundred new customers and some of them are you know notable brands like uh, the Bank of Hawaii and Western Digital and Blackstone. Uh, but you know we, we 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 saw this momentum since the beginning of the year. We also had more than a hundred new customers in Q1 and 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 in Q2, and we expect it to continue in Q4. So we actually expect more than 400 customers new customers to join, uh, you know, variant uh, by the end of the year. So it's, it's, a, it's a trend that now has been established, uh, and, and we feel very strongly that it's a result of the, the strength of the platform as well as the uh, agnostic strategy. Excellent. Thanks for the color there. And then, you know, on the, on the raised outlook as we start to think about the fiscal 24 targets being higher, I'm just curious to, about what you're seeing from a visibility perspective to give you confidence in these, this higher outlook. You know, what, what are you seeing from a roadmap perspective as you talk to your customers that are looking to, to migrate over? Thanks. Yeah, so visibility has actually improved quite a bit. Um, obviously, uh, you know, partially it's because of the uh, growth in recurring revenue. We, we're now, you know, around 83% of our uh, software revenue is recurring, so that, that's improved visibility, but also uh, pipeline. You know, we, we see, um, you know, Doug mentioned RPO, our remaining performance obligation is up 31% year over year. Uh, we, we see strong uh, demand in the pipeline and also a big shift. Uh, so we actually expect, in terms of the pipeline mix, we expect 60% uh, 60 of the booking in Q4 to be from SaaS, and for next year we expect 65% of the booking uh, to come from SaaS. So, so pipeline suggests uh, 
overall strength and and uh, and also uh, continuing shi- uh, uh, shift mix uh, uh, toward toward SaaS. Uh, we also raised our PLE, uh, PLE bookings guidance for next year. Uh, we took it from 10% to uh, higher to a range of 10 to 12%. Obviously, this year we now expect more than 15% booking growth. Uh, so we, we we hope that we'll continue to see strong momentum into next year as well. But um, you know, all these are are helpful to visibility. Uh, when you look at our Q4. Cloud revenue, uh, we're expecting 117, so that, that's a good starting point for another year of uh, more than 30% growth. Uh, so that will bring us to more than half, half, a, half a billion dollars in cloud revenue and, and even more um, recurring revenue, so, so improved visibility. So really on all, on all fronts, uh, we, we feel like, you know, uh, strategy is working. Uh, we, we're over the midpoint of our cloud transition. So our, our revenue growth is now accelerating because we have less headwinds from, from the perpetual decline. So we, we gave targets for, you know, 7% growth next year and 10% growth um, the following year on, 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 overall, uh, on overall revenue and cloud revenue continuing to grow at, uh, at 30%. Um, so it looks good. looks good. It sounds good for my end as well. Uh, congrats again. I'll hop back in the queue. And our next question comes from Dan Eyes from Wedbush. Your line is now open. Yeah, thanks. So can you just talk about, in terms of the cloud transition, it feels like you've sort of crossed that line now to, to sort of like almost the second half as we sort of get into the inflection point more than 50%. Can you just talk about that? Like, like what are sort of now – the triggers that we should see going forward as it feels like you're kind of past the midway point of the transition? Yeah. So, you know, the, the midpoint is very important. So, uh, so first, just to make, make, make it clear, we, we passed the midpoint in booking and, and we expect to pass the midpoint in revenue um, during next year and, and, and get to 55% of uh, revenue to be cloud. So what, what happens with, with, as we get more cloud revenue uh, are a number of things. First, visibility will continue to improve uh, as we get more recurring revenue. Uh, second, we'll see improvement in cloud revenue growth because we are going double digit in booking, right? We have a lot of new customers we added. We talk about more than 15%. We now raise the guidance to between 15 to 17% booking growth this year. So all this booking acceleration will start to contribute more into revenue acceleration because the perpetual decline is less material. Uh, we, we just have less perpetual. So obviously uh, revenue acceleration, but also um, gross margin acceleration. When you look at our gross margin mix, our non-recurring gross margin is in the mid-50s because Perpetual carries a lot of professional services. So so that's a mid-50s average gross margin for non-recurring. But the recurring margin is the mid-70s. So as recurring goes up, also gross margin will start to go up modestly next year and more and more in, in the following years. Um, and we talked about, you know, um, uh, better economics um, and, and improved cash flows. So crossing the midpoint is really uh, you go uphill and you get a lot of uh, headwind uh, on the way up and, and you start to get tailwind on, on, on the way down, which is what we're starting next year. Great. And then can we just talk about, in terms of just size of deals, like as you think about pipeline and you know, kind of like you're hitting it as we sort of get through the midpoint, should we expect just larger deal sizes, more strategic? Is that a trend? Thanks. Yes, I think uh, uh, we are becoming more strategic to our customers and partners um, because they can consume more from a cloud platform in a very consistent way. You know, all, all the applications we have and and, and you guys know that we have acquired companies over the years, and while we, we put all this technology that we acquired in one platform, which, which gives customers the ability to expand very easily just consuming more services rather than, you know, going through the whole effort of uh, on-prem deployment. So, so that makes the, the um, you know, the relationship more strategic. They can benefit from innovation in AI much faster in the cloud platform. 
Uh, our partners, you know, have access to a lot of AI innovation quickly through our DaVinci services. So all this effort we put into the platform is really positioning us uh, to, to have more uh, footprint with our customers and partners. And, um, you know, we expect uh, when they look at the mix right now, we generate about half of our revenue from uh, direct and, and half from, from indirect, from, from partners. We, we expect both to grow nicely and, and partners to grow a little bit faster. So the 50-50 ratio will probably be not that materially different in a year or two, but, but, uh, but the indirect will, will slightly go faster. And, uh, and that's good for us because, you know, we, we have a lot of leverage um, with partners and, and, and don't have to add a lot of, uh, you know, salespeople as we continue to accelerate our growth rates. So, um, you know, putting all that into, um, you know, the context of, of, of the journey, uh, we, we think that for us, cloud is not just a change in business model, but it, it was the ability to really offer a single platform that is open, that is connected to the ecosystem. We have a lot of out-of-the-box integrations. Uh, we now have a pretty significant ISV program, so a lot of companies are developing applications on our platform, and we're listing these companies in our marketplace so the customers can benefit from the open platform. So creating that ecosystem of uh, ISV partners, creating an ecosystem of out-of-the-box integrations with enterprise data systems and enterprise um, um, uh, CRM or HR or, or any, any type of enterprise system that uh, is, is important to be integrated into customer engagement, uh, uh, customers and partners can consume that very easily from a cloud platform. So, so you know, it's a, it's, it's a big innovation. We, we spend a lot of time and effort in building that platform, and, and we, we, we believe it's very differentiated right now. And because it's open and agnostic, you know, we see a lot of um, – uh, changes in the communication infrastructure market. Um, you know, we saw just lately 8x8 eight, eight eight, um, is acquiring Fuse, so, so that's a, you know, consolidation of Sikas and Yukas. Uh, we, 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 we saw, you know, um, Zoom trying to buy 5.9 for the same reason, um, and, and WebEx is announced uh, um, a Sikas offering, and, and Avaya has Yukas and Sikas, and Microsoft has announced a, you know, an extension of teams uh, in, into the Connect Center. So all this uh, uh, infrastructure consolidation across the Connect Center and the enterprise is really the starting point for more demand for our platform because we have applications that are uh, across, the, across the enterprise connecting the Connect Center into other parts of the, uh, of the enterprise in a way that can generate a lot of business ROI. Right, so, so customers buy infrastructure based on you know their IT ecosystem and, and what they need for it from it, from uh, from the infrastructure, but but customers really need a strong application platform to create business ROI applications with workflows and automation that drive business ROI and and this is where Variant is right. We we are in this bucket of very strong best of breed applications all available in one platform. So customers can, can consume those services in a very consistent manner. Thanks. And thank you. And our next question comes from Peter Levine from Evercore. Your line is now open. Great. Thanks for taking my question. Um, sorry if I missed it, but cloud growth in the quarter is sort of sequential D-cell. Maybe um, first, is just, can you just kind of talk about those dynamics where there are deals that pulled into Q2 or perhaps that deals got pulled into Q4, just like to understand um, what happened in the quarter? Yeah. Um, so let's look at the numbers, right? We, we started the year with a cloud growth expectation of 30%. And then we upped it to 30 to 35 percent. Then we upped it again to 35. And today we're upping the cloud growth for the year between 35 percent and 37. So I don't think we are decelerating. I think every quarter we raised our, um, you know, our expectation for cloud growth this year. And um, when when you dissect the cloud growth, um, you can see that. Um, in cloud, we have SaaS and we have managed services. And managed services, as we discussed 
uh, many times is, is something we offer our customers as a service. It's low margin, and we don't plan to grow that that much. So in Q3, managed services grew 10%, uh, which is fine, but SaaS grew 38%. So uh, we continue to see very strong growth in Q3, and we expect uh, acceleration Q4. So, so that's why we are raising, uh, raising our cloud growth guidance to uh, you know, more than 35%. So the bottom line is I, I think we, we, are, we are progressing very well through the year. Uh, we, we see a pipeline shifting. We see cloud uh, deals uh, that were potentially um, – you know, customers were looking to buy perpetual, shifting to the cloud much faster. Um, and, and I think that, you know, quarter to quarter, there could be small fluctuations, but uh, I'm, I'm very pleased with over 30% growth in Q3, uh, as well as, you know, uh, raising, again, guidance for Q4. And, and you know, the numbers, the numbers are also getting bigger, and, and we still think that we can achieve more than half a billion in cloud revenue next year. And if you look at, uh, you know, the, the, the Q4 expectation, uh, that's a very solid, solid start for achieving the, you know, the half a billion uh, next year. So I, I don't see any deceleration in, in demand for cloud, and, and I think we uh, are well positioned to, to uh, you know, pro- pro- provide customers cloud solutions when, when, they, when, they, when they are ready. You know, some, some customers are saying, yes, we, we, we are going to go cloud, but not now. Uh, but when they're ready, we, we, we are ready, and, and we continue to see very good growth. All right, so, and then maybe to, to that point, you know, what's the catalyst that jump starts, I think, the conversation to move to the cloud, or even if you go to IT, right? Is it, is it a line of business that, that's making these purchase decisions, meaning how much of that is being driven by, like, contact center upgrades versus more of, like, a digital transformation within customer engagement? Yeah, so I think it's predominantly digital transformation. Um, when you look at our cloud growth, more than 60% comes from new deals, right? So less than 40% is actually conversion. Uh, the, 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 so if you look at like our, our 35 to 37% cloud growth this year, and more than 60% is new deals, so that, that's like 21%. And, and 15% comes from conversion. So I think that gives you the, the, the idea that uh, – you know, even if we didn't have any conversion in our base, we will still be growing at 21% because of digital transformation and demand for uh, new functionality. Look, the, the contact center is disrupted. Um, you know, how many times people go online and try to do something before they, they call the contact center? It's very often. And when they call the contact center, they expect the contact center to understand what they did. What was their journey before they called? So the contact center is, is Disrupted by digital because uh, customers expect more um, contextual and connected, um, you know, experiences, and, and the customer needs to be connected to the back office, to uh, to the to the um, online the, and self service uh, um, channels that are mostly designed by marketing, uh, customer experience teams that measure experience across the journey. And, and that's what, that's what we, we provide in our, in our platform. We, we specifically, you know, emphasize that we design the platform to close the engagement capacity gap. And, and the capacity gap is, is, is created because of the increase in the number of digital touch points and digital interaction. It's just more and more of them, and you just, you know, organization cannot add people to, to address it, so they need more automation. And that drive, that the demand for automation is driving our growth because we, we, we are an application platform and, and, you know, agnostic to the infrastructure, but our customers really need to make changes and, and buy applications that can help them close that gap because otherwise they'll, they'll just have consumers that have terrible experiences. And, and you know, also when, when our customers report to us, they report great ROI. You know, we discussed the Forrester report last quarter, where where Forrester approached our customers, and you know, the ROI was um, 300% over three years, and and payback in less than six months. And um, you know, they also report to us that when they when they deploy these type of solutions, they can also increase revenue. So it's not just that it's not only that they can reduce the the, the the 
you know, the spend on workforce and elevate the customer experience. Elevating customer experience creates opportunity for upsell and increasing revenues. So, so, so the demand to, to, you know, it was a long answer, but the demand for our cloud growth really is driven by this whole digital transformation that our customers are, go, are, are going through. Great. Thank you very much for the caller. Thank you. And our next question comes from Samad Samana from Jeffries. Your line is now open. Hi. Good evening. Thanks for thanks for taking my questions. Um, maybe just uh, first on the on the long term guidance. I just want to double check: is that all organic? The assumptions for fiscal twenty three and fiscal twenty four, or does that assume some level of M and A as well? And then I have a quick follow up as well. Yeah, so, so we, don't, we don't assume any future M&A. We had uh, the conversational M&A that we did earlier in the year, right? We, we talked about, you know, that that's going to contribute about, you know, $6 million this year. And because we did it, um, you know, seven months into the year, that there's going to be some contribution into next year. But, you know, it's, it's a few million dollars of inorganic in the guidance for next year. And, and that's it. We don't, we don't assume any future M&A in 23 or 24. Great. Thanks for that. And then, um, Doug, maybe one for you, just to better understand the expenses that, that fell out of 3Q into 4Q. Wanted to make sure I heard that correctly. And just was that uh, due to hiring being tougher? Was that due to, you know, a T&E? Just maybe help us triangulate what those expenses were and, and how that could impact um, the, the business. Yeah, there's no big uh, trend, Smart. So it's just some timing around some things that, uh, you know, our folks kind of pulled the trigger on a little sooner than we had planned for in our model, if you will. Um, so just some, some timing of, uh, of expenses hitting Q3 rather than Q4 in the numbers. Um, you know, we're still investing in the business, so expect, you know, Q4 OPEX to, uh, to ramp a little bit off of, uh, you know, Q3 levels uh, and then and come down a little bit in, um, you know, Q1. Um, so probably next year uh, we'll probably have about 7% OPEX growth, uh, you know, for the full year. Great. And then maybe just one last one, uh, just to ask a couple of, of quickies, which is um, when you think about um, the the end um, contact center seat that, that Verant WFO is being attached to, have you seen any change in the mix of that in, this quarter, you know, if you think about, whether they're using 5.9 or in contact or, or Genesis, any evolution in who you're attaching your WFO to? So, we, we, yeah, we've seen the, from a contact center infrastructure perspective, we see a lot of fragmentation. So, uh, you know, we have uh, the Avaya Seekers offering that is uh, launched to the market. We have... Uh, Cisco, uh, new WebEx SICAS offering, obviously Amazon Connect and Twilio and, uh, you know, and there's smaller players like the 8x8 and Vonage and, and, you know, we, we partner with all these guys because when customers need applications and they want best of breed, you know, that, that, that's variant. Um, so when you look at 5.9, you know, 5.9 is a partner, uh, the revenue, the revenue we have today with 5.9 is still very small, but it's been, it's been growing this year because they, they, they started to go up market, and we expect it to continue to grow next year as they continue to go to up market. So uh, the, the smaller, you know, or the, the vendors that we've been targeting more of the SMB market, as, as they go up market, they need more sophisticated, sophisticated applications, and that's where, uh, you know, customers really uh, – one variant, and, and many times, you know, the customers actually decide on the applications, and then they, they choose the uh, communication infrastructure vendor. So uh, the partnership is, is really one that benefits both sides uh, because more and more in the digital transformation, the business needs are actually more important than the IT infrastructure needs. And as they look to close the engagement capacity gap, they want more AI, more analytics, uh, that, that's the leading, um, uh, the, the leading uh, requirement, right? The, the first, they want to make sure they have ROI, and then they want to make sure that the, the uh, infrastructure supports it. So, so we see, to your question, we see customers that want to buy uh, 
infrastructure and application at the same time, but I think we also see more and more customers that understand that they can bifurcate these decisions, that uh, if, if they need applications now because that, that helps them, you know, close some gaps and, and drive ROI, they don't necessarily have to change their infrastructure right away. They, they can make that decision late, later on. Uh, so we see we see all all all, all the above, uh, but clearly the 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 S and B you know the, the smaller the customer is the smaller their contact center, uh, the the less urgent is their their need for um, you know business application that close the gap, and the more sophisticated and larger uh, organizations really feel the pain of digital transformation and they are leading with you know business applications first. Great. Thank, thank you. Appreciate that. And thank you. And our next question comes from Brian Essex from Goldman Sachs. The line is now open. Great. Thank you. And thank you for taking the question. Uh, maybe, Dan, for, for perpetual revenue, would like to just, you know, you know, thank you. Thank you for the revised forecast on cloud, by the way. And I, But I'd like to kind of back into perpetual revenue to see if your outlook there has changed at all, I think previously, um, you know, your team had thought that this would kind of level off in the 100 million range. How should we think about incremental perpetual sales? Um, how much visibility do you have into that? And, and has your outlook changed? Is it just a matter of, like, looking through your pipeline and, and you have a certain hit rate that tends to be perpetual? Or uh, just love a little bit more color, um, how to think about that, particularly longer term. Yeah, sure. So, so first and very important is that we um, today uh, we allow our salesforce to sell perpetual only by exception. They have to go through an exception process, and uh, believe me, they they don't they don't want to sell perpetual. They want to sell SaaS. Uh, but we do have a number of customers. That it's not a large number, but it's a it's a typically the larger customers that we know that for now we have to give them exceptions. You know, interesting, we talked about uh, the $4 million deal that came earlier. Uh, we expected it in Q, uh, Q4, and it came in Q3, and it's a perpetual deal from a large telecom um, customer. And, uh, and what's interesting about this deal, not, not only it came earlier, but actually we were surprised that the customer was entertaining going to SaaS, and we didn't think it's good they're going to do it this year. We, we thought maybe next year, uh, but, but they were entertaining it eventually, they decided not now, and um, I, we, I see that as a very good, um, you know, good good development. That uh, even this very large telecom customer is starting to um, move um, and, and consider it. At least they, they requested uh, to, to understand how how the proposal will will look like in SAS. And look, there's timing issues. You know, they, 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 these are complex organizations. They have compliance um, needs. They have security needs. Uh, IT may have all kind of uh, priorities, uh, w what they want to shift to SaaS and what they want to keep uh, on-prem. Uh, I, I do believe that the, the entire industry is shifting to SaaS. There's no, no question about it in my mind. Uh, and the dialogue with customers suggests that. But um, I think that uh, right now our, our view is that in 24. Yeah, we'll have about $100 million, which will be tens of customers, not, not more than tens of customers, and about $100 million in 24 that will still be perpetual. Um, will that uh, con continue to, to get uh, smaller? Uh, probably over time, probably over time. But, uh, you know, the, the, the big thing with perpetual for variant was that the perpetual was very big, and every decline was, was, was a big headwind. Uh, even that, you know, booking was good. Uh, the revenue decline was, was material, and, and I think that uh, as we have very large cloud baseline now that is growing 30%, uh, even, even if perpetual will decline a little bit uh, faster, uh, I still think we have a good chance to accelerate growth rates, uh, overall revenue growth rates. Got it. That's super helpful. <clears throat> and maybe, maybe to follow up, you know, as we think about, you know, the overall environment just from a macro point of view, you know, I recall, you know, during the pandemic, um, you know, there were there were issues with regards to, you know, needing to be, you know, in customer facilities, um, you know, to sell certain certain types of software. 
as we as we kind of evaluate the news flow that we see every day, I mean, do you see anything that that's materially disruptive as I don't know new new variants pop up or or you know travel issues arise from from one geography to the other any, anything anything that we might be able to digest that might impact your business one way or the other um so so from a travel perspective we don't need we we got organized to to do mostly remotely. When we do need to travel, we, we do. Um, it, it's not an issue today, but it's really not very common. So I don't expect uh, travel restrictions to make things worse. Um, but I think that the fact that we now have, uh, you know, these new variants and, and more and more customers realize that, you know, this pandemic is going to stay with us maybe longer, uh, it, it, it does help to uh, the cloud acceleration. I, th- I think that that's probably one of the reasons we see even the larger customers uh, realizing uh, it's time to move to cloud and benefit from doing everything remotely. And, and it's also helpful in terms of demand for more visibility tools and, and analytics tools as, as the workforce, you know, is all kind of scattered and, uh, you know, management needs to really uh, be able to provide uh, people at home with, with the right tools and be able to understand, you know, what, what, what works and what doesn't work. So, yeah, that, that probably drives more demand. Um, but mm. I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't see any customers really thinking that they just need to hold their breath and, uh, and, and wait for the pandemic to be over. I think customers realize that they're going to need to buy into these workforce optimization tools because uh, first, you know, uh, people will – probably work hybrid anyway uh, in the future. Um, you know, uh, 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 there are more and more customers are hiring people in a lot of different locations because there's a hot labor market and, you know, they, they want to take advantage of where they can hire. So uh, the days where everybody sits, you know, in one office uh, are gone. And, and the digital transformation um, is really the biggest uh, drive for, you know, uh, AI so, so some people can be replaced with automation. So all these trends, uh, I think the pandemic was accelerating the shift, but uh, the fact that the pandemic may, may take longer may be, may be somewhat helpful to acceleration, but doesn't change the, you know, the overall trends. Got it. That's super helpful. Thank you. And thank you. And our next question comes from Dan Bergstrom from RBC Capital Market. Your line is now open. My questions. Say, so maybe could we look at the nearer term side of Brian's previous question? You know, it sounds like we're expecting a typically seasonally strong fourth quarter here, less perpetual uh, than previously, obviously, and you provided some guidance around the cloud. But, you know, is there pr- the potential for, for a more pronounced break in customer preference towards the cloud? with all the business in the quarter. You know, you just talked about that large perpetual customer that closed early was considering SaaS or, 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 you know, do you feel like you have a pretty good visibility around customer preference at this point in the quarter? I, I do. I do. Um, I, I, I see 60% or more in SaaS in Q4. So, so I definitely um, believe that's the, best, that that's the best quarter we'll have in terms of this shift. Um, and, and as we look at the pipeline into next year, we, we believe 65% will be SaaS. So, um, and, and when we analyze that further, we also see that the one that remain perpetual, again, are, are smaller and smaller universe of customers that are just going to take longer in the decision making, but it's not a, per, a pervasive uh, trend. It's, uh, it, it's limited to, to customers. And, you know, we announced – just in the quarter, 21 uh, multi-million dollar deals. Uh, last quarter, we had also, I think, about 20 multi-million dollar deals. So, uh, and that's just cloud deals. Uh, so, so, so we do have uh, um, some, some large customers that, that will continue next year to buy perpetual, but the number of those customers will, will, will be small. Uh, so the trend is very, very clear. And um, I, I think that, you know, in the past I spoke about the industry is shifting. Um, some customers are ready, some are not ready. I think today I can say 
you know, every customer realized that, that that's where they're going. It's just a matter of when. Great. That's helpful. And then maybe for Doug, Doug, could you just help us think through the cash flow dynamics here over the next several years? Dan touched on this a bit in the prepared remarks and in response to a question. Um, but, you know, it seems like the second half of the cloud transition, typically we, we really start to see the benefit in cash flow. I think those previous headwinds that built up, you know, RPO and deferred should be coming in as a tailwind to cash flow. Is that the right way to think about the dynamics for cash flow from here? Yeah, exactly, Dan. We touched on this a little bit last quarter as well, um, kind of as we look out. Um, so you can see this quarter we had a very good quarter. Uh, next quarter we expect a strong quarter. Uh, so we'll probably come in around 180 on a, uh, you know, before, before uh, non-recurring items uh, from a, a cash from hops. Um, and as you, as you mentioned, uh, there's a bit of a waterfall uh, of cash kind of coming in, just the way the revenue accelerates, uh, you know, the cash accelerates uh, into next year too. Um, so coming off of this year's base, we should uh, grow maybe 20% uh, in terms of, you know, cash uh, before non-recurring items, uh, cash from ops next year. Um, and then probably, that's probably the big uh, kind of windfall in, if you will, and then kind of uh, leveling and, and think about cash kind of growing with uh, earnings uh, at that point, kind of low double digits, uh, similar to earnings, but, you know, still very strong cash growth. That's great. Appreciate that, Doc. Thanks. Sure. And thank you. And now I would like to turn the call back to Matthew Frankel for closing remarks. Great. Thanks, Operator, and thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out, and uh, we'll talk to, uh, talk to you again soon. Have a good night. Bye-bye. This concludes today's conference call. Thank you for participating. You may now dis